So good morning. How are you? My name is Edgar. Um, the only thing France will say that's correct is um, humble. Everything else is, <laughs> is irrelevant. Uh, if it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm going to try and share some reflections. And the only reason I say some reflections is I'm very privileged to work in an area called emerging business. Um, and in the last year and a half, I've been really, really trying to figure out how you move a tanker of a company that's Ericsson, you know, to be really cool like Retro Rabbit. Uh, and that's so really freaking hard. I'm going to try and control my language. Um, I've been very privileged to discuss with Francois. I think we've had about two or three sessions. And uh, I think you are very lucky to be working at Retro Rabbit. I honestly hope that I get a chance to collaborate with you guys in a personal capacity um, because of some of the engagements I've had with Francois. I think he's incredibly brilliant, but he's also incredibly insane. <laughs> but I'm sure you know that already. So today I'm going to talk about what I think is quite an interesting shift that we're going through. Um, uh, and I like to really, everybody's talking about fourth industrial revolution, digital era, whatever you'd like to call it. But I, I honestly think we're going through a fundamental change in society, not just from a business perspective, value, uh, and we'll touch on that, um, but also just generally how we'll exist, you know, how, and I think there's going to be profoundly good benefits uh, for us. I think we're moving into what I would call a socially conscious capitalist world. Um, but please, engage, challenge, uh, and I'm sure you can challenge because I'm sure everybody in this room is much brighter than I am. Uh, so I look forward to your reflections. Please ask questions, by the way, at any time. Uh, it's not uh, uh, wait till the end to ask questions. So everything we know about the current industries has changed and will continue to change, and, and many people can say that. Uh, but also, the hard thing is we really, really, really don't like to change. I think I spoke to Liz and Jade, and you know, when we talk about the digital era and digital transformation, what I see is the hardest thing is actually the cultural, philosophical, human aspects of change. Uh, and I've been in Ericsson for 14 years, I worked in MTN for two years, uh, I have two degrees in engineering, but honestly speaking, I am really, really, really trying to learn afresh, honestly speaking, and that's very, very hard for me. Uh, I would really like to meet a lot of you guys. Unfortunately, I'm going to leave after this presentation, but maybe we'll have a chance to, ca to, to catch up. I really want to learn, uh, and I honestly think that your generation and the generation below is actually... And by the way, I'm not much older than you, so when I say your generation... <laughs> I don't mean that I'm like 60 or something. Uh, it's going to change a lot of things, and it's pretty cool. Uh, but I think we have a lot to learn. I'm going to play two videos, uh, and, it's, and hopefully the videos will give context to some of the things I'm going to say. Uh, so hopefully they work. The first is a video you might have seen, and I'll touch on the reason why I played this video later. It has nothing to do with Parliament and, and the young boy in Parliament, but it's fascinating to listen to this young man, and it's it's fascinating that we reflect on, on why I played this video. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, so my question, well, it's not really much of a question. Well, it's kind of like a statement. So um, let's say we're in 2019 and it's the elections. And a child wants to vote, but they don't have that opportunity to vote because they are under age. Um, what if we make this change? What if the child um, studies and studies all the things that different political parties want to um, change in the country? And they understand the depth of what they're doing and they go through one or two assessments and they have like the in, the voting intelligence of an adult because just because somebody has a different age than another person does not necessarily mean that they should have less um, access to things because of their age or anything like that but like um, Many ch um, adults expect children to be 
um, to, to not have as much intelligence as um, adults, but if the child... <laughs> this always technology. I don't know what happened. I think the laptop... Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I don't know if we can fast forward now so we don't... Um, so my question so the, the, was not met... The video is two minutes. I don't want us to play it again in the interest of time. There's a reason I played this video and it's fascinating. There's probably about one more minute left. I have no idea how old that young man is. He's probably... I don't know, a wild case would be eight or nine or ten. But the reason I play that video is I think that young man has probably read or has had access to more information, and I'm going to share my age, uh, I'm 39, than me, simply because he's been born in an information era. And that significantly changes everything. The fact that this young man, he's probably very smart. I didn't play it because I think he's extremely smart. I played it because... He's born in a world that's completely different from most of us, uh, maybe not most of you and most of the generations before. Uh, and information is ubiquitous. And if you give people access to information, probably in like two years, somebody who is five will be able to do this because they're just consuming uh, and they are boundaryless. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, these are your consumers today. And I think this is going to change everything. I, you know, I can't try and speculate or hypothesize, uh, but I think we probably will not need university degrees in a few years' time. Uh, I mean, Google and IBM, I think, and Microsoft already came out with tweets yesterday talking about the fact that the university degree is no longer an entry requirement. But it's because everything has changed, and, and with what gave us relevance was what we would call our engineering, our capability, or what I would call our knowledge, and that's now ubiquitous. But if you combine that with, with combining the fact that we are now so digital in how we behave, uh, which we will touch on, on what, well, what we think is digital, it completely changes the dynamics of life. It completely changes the dynamics of behavior. And it also completely changes the aspects of control. Um, and you guys probably know better and will probably reflect on this. Uh, companies thought they would build products and sell them to the market. But when you have a consumer that is so knowledgeable, so demanding, so, um, you know, access to so much choice, you're only successful if you build a product together with the consumer. And what does that mean? And that means that things we talk about, like co-creation, prototyping, are not just buzzwords, they're relevant, they're, re they're important, because nobody cares about your product. Nobody cares about how much your idea is great. Um, and not in a bad way. It's only relevant if, if it speaks to them. If they can use it, they can touch it, they can feel it, it's personalized, it gives them instant gratification, gives them choice, and I think you guys in Retro Rabbit probably understand this more than some of us in corporates, because you work very much from the perspective of, let's try and build a cool experience, let's try and solve a problem. And it's going to get faster and better. But when you combine that with how you see what I would call the triple effect, technology, and I'm not going to talk about technology because I don't have as much knowledge as you guys in terms of technology, um, everything is going to change so fast. AI, machine learning, you, already all, you guys all know about this, but we're also entering a world where the speed and pace of technology is, is ubiquitous. I think Vodafone Group did a study where they showed that in the next 100 years, if you look linearly, we're going to have an equivalent of 20,000 years of technology advancements. Now, it's very hard to try and explain that or understand that, uh, but what it means is that it's going to completely change everything. It's going to completely change what jobs look like. It's going to completely change uh, what value looks like. It's going to completely change what we need to know. Um, and I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to say that I think it's going to be an exciting new world, but in this change, it also means that we have to continuously think about how fast things are changing and continuously learn. The other thing that's fascinating is that competition was looked at traditionally. I come from a telecoms industry, and I also think the telecoms industry is dead, by the way, and we can have a whole conversation about that. But uh, the telecom industry is dead because the telecoms industry was driven by two things, cell voice, cell data. So when, data, when the need shifted to data, 
people, telecoms companies thought they would sell data, but data is ubiquitous now because data is just an enabler for an experience. Uh, and I hate to talk about the experience world because I'm not as qualified as you, but what the advances in data did was create a whole new era of companies and not just advances in data, many things, uh, and we can call them digitally born. Uh, but the f fascinating thing about these companies, and by the way, I'm not obsessed with these companies. I know we all use the same examples, but it's just, it's just a way to give an illustration. The fascinating things about these companies is not only so much the fact that they're asset light, all the things people will tell you, they're platform companies, they command, com connect demand and supply, uh, the fascinating thing about these companies is that they completely changed what you would call competition. Competition was very uh, physical, it was geographical. You were competing against the company in South Africa or the company next door. Uh, you were competing against the guy next door. Now you're competing for an experience. DSTV's biggest com cut competition right now is Netflix. They don't have any presence in South Africa. But what they did is they just simply made the uh, the digital experience personalized. They gave you choice. They allowed you to, which is speaking to who we are already, they allowed you to pick a movie when you want it on demand versus the DSTV experience. And by the way, I love sports and I'm a premium subscriber, so <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> I don't think DSTV is dead yet. Uh, but most of the premium subscribers in, in, the, in the urban areas in, in, in South Africa are already getting off premium, except those who really, really love sports. And you might not know that Amazon has premiership rights, or Facebook, for example, had the rights for the PGA Championship, so Sky and BBC couldn't show that. But I give these examples because the one other fascinating aspect beyond the fact that they have completely demystified what we call our geographical boundaries in competition, they also have completely demystified product areas because they the only thing these companies are obsessed with is using your data to understand what you want. So they're obsessed with the customer and his needs and his experience. And if you're obsessed with the customer and the needs and experience, you're not obsessed with your product. You're only looking to serve his needs and experience. And because they already have all the other cool things that they're innovative, they're agile, they're nimble, they can pivot, they can give you the experience. And like my business professor said many years ago, they're probably going to eat most of companies' lunch, uh, companies lunch meals because of the fact that as companies today obsess about their product set, these guys will obsess about the customer. And we will come to the customer in a second. Um, but I think it's an important thing to reflect on. You know? And because we're in a world of exponential, they will scale exceptionally fast. Because the other thing we need to reflect on, and guys, please challenge me. These are just reflections. This is not me preaching. The other thing we need to reflect on is that because of the socially connected world, the aspect of marketing and PR simply doesn't exist. If Amazon or WhatsApp or Airbnb or RetroRabbit gives a cool experience, in one day it's trending on WhatsApp, in two days, you have 100,000 users. In one month, you could have a million users. Basically, the social networks take over. So the thing is not how well do I market my product. The thing is how cool an experience or how much can I touch the consumer. And the moment you do that, the world takes over. And that's the scary thing that traditional companies don't exist. They still think and sit there in rooms with PR and marketing. And frankly, if you combine that with that little kid who is so well informed, who has choice, he doesn't give a damn about your marketing or what you're sending out. He only cares about what he's feeling. How personalized is it to me? Does it speak to me? Can I feel the experience? Can I enjoy it? And finally, the one fundamental beautiful thing about the digital era is the changing consumer. So because, I mean, I have another slide on that, so I will not go on and on. And, and we talk about all these things combined, but the big driver of all this aspect is how we are changing. I think I was talking to Liz or Jade, I can't remember, and I said we can talk endlessly about digital transformation, but at the end of the day, it's as simple as, do I understand my customer? Do I understand how he's changing? Am I serving his need? Not, I have a great product, I have a great hypothesis, so I think I'm so cool. We actually all think we're cool. That's the problem with human beings. <laughs> but uh, who is my customer? What does he need today? How does he behave? How do I solve his problem? And the customer is changing so fast. Aspects like control, telling people what to do, no longer work. It's engagement, it's conversations, it's working together. 
is prototyping, and all those things are just simply about am I touching my customer, what does he want, what's the experience, he's telling me I need to do this differently, and I do this differently, and I stay relevant. And that, I think, is probably one of the most important things that anybody needs to understand. I was privileged also being an executive program for Amazon just this week in Johannesburg, and um, they have this concept called working backwards. By the way, if you guys don't know Jeff Bezos, read a little bit about Jeff Bezos, the Amazon CEO. I mean, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, you know, just some of the concepts that he talks about day one, how he simplifies what they do on Amazon. And Amazon has problems. They're not a miracle company. They have 500,000 employees, so they'll have all the problems with big... But the one thing that they do really, really well is they really, really obsess about the customer. And I think over the years, Jeff Bezos has made sure that that stays central. So this whole workshop was about working backwards. And that sounds obvious, but basically, what, what they obsess about Amazon is really, really working from the customer problem or the hypothesis or the real problem they're solving, not from their cool software, uh, to developing the product. Um, and that's important. Uh, a scary statistic is Amazon's valuation uh, was just, just hit a trillion dollars, I think, this month, or, or it was well, yesterday I saw on Twitter they had a trillion dollars. But the scary statistic is not so much that they're in a trillion dollars. The scary statistic is that a year ago, their valuation was $500 billion. So basically, they've doubled in one year. And the only reason that happens is that if you look at Amazon's portfolio, it's just exploding. But it's also because Amazon really, really, really speaks to the digital era of a digital consumer who really, really wants you to solve his problem, and that's becoming accelerating. We're, we're people of convenience. We're, we're animals of convenience. I mean, we might not say it, we might not talk about it loud, but right now we just want convenience. Our attention span is getting worse and worse and worse. You know, if we click two, three times and we don't like it, we're gone. You know, if you're not solving my problem instantly, we don't want to go to a bank, we don't want to talk to anybody, we want a bot, and that's just going increasingly and increasingly and increasingly and increasingly. But what that means is that to stay relevant, you have to be thinking about how do I make somebody's life convenient? How do I in instant gratification, simplicity, choice, convenience, user experience? There's a cool video I'll play at the end about Volvo and user experience, but that's important. Uh, and that's why I say I don't want to preach to you guys because you, you guys probably understand user experience a little bit more than most of the traditional companies, but it's as simple as that. It's as simple as understanding that we're, our behaviors are changing and the younger generations are, are more. And you combine that with the fact that a consumer has never been more knowledgeable than he has ever been in his life, and that's why I played the video. We'll probably try and play the video, because it's quite cool at the end uh, uh, of that uh, six-year-old or eight-year-old. If you combine all those aspects, you start to understand that you don't have control. It's not about you, it's not about how cool you think your idea is, or it's not about how cool you think your software is, and the software will be cool. And It's all about the problem you're solving, the experience you're enabling, making people's lives simpler, uh, making it personalized, and we'll have a small slide on that, um, and giving them an experience that they love. And if you do that, you win. If you don't, Amazon takes over, or Apple, or WhatsApp, I'm sure you're all on WhatsApp, or all these guys, because that's all they obsess about. But they also now are no longer the only ones who can do that, and that's the cool thing about the world. You know, the resources that are available to program, to code, to play around with experiences, and I'm sure you'd know this much more than I do, and that's why I'd like to talk to you guys. Are ubiquitous, but also the problem is that because they're ubiquitous, you're no longer competing with a guy who has $100 million. You're competing with a kid who is in his basement, and I know I, they use these examples and they just really happen all the time, but it's as simple as that, who can access web services, who can access some cloud and programming services, who is just simply trying to solve an experience simply trying to solve a problem. You're competing with that guy. And of course, there are many other complications because it needs a little bit of money because we can talk about scale. But you're no longer, it no longer needs $500 million and five headquarters and I don't know how many server rooms to win. And that not only will create new opportunities, but will completely change competition. Honestly, I honestly believe it will completely change competition. 
We talk about companies or how we look at the Fortune 500, and there's so many statistics that 9 out of 10 of the Fortune 500 companies from 1955 don't exist. And in the last 10 years, 7 out of 10 of those companies in the top 10 are all digitally born companies. I think we're going to see an acceleration of that. I think we're going to completely see organizations become smaller, nimble, many will disappear. Uh, but I also think we're going to see a lot of cool companies coming up like you guys, who are just simply obsessed with solving the customer's problem. And I'm saying that because I know that's what you do, right? <laughs> Sorry, you have a question. Do you feel like being, can I challenge something? Yes, please. So are we on to discussion point yet? <laughs> yeah, no, no, please. I mean, okay. this, is, this is some thoughts. I'm rambling, so yeah. yeah. So you say digital equalizes opportunities. So someone who's come from working within emerging markets within Africa, and there are people who still don't have electricity. Yeah. Are we truly, I know it's mess in some ways it could be maybe No, no, it but better? it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, that's a fascinating point, because every time I get questions, I keep telling people, if I was, and this, these are conversations actually that really, really should be at, uh, at strategic level in governments. If I met any president today, I think he has two priorities. And I'm not saying electricity, roads, and, in, and infrastructure are not priorities. I think if, if in a company you put the priority number one to make sure everybody in your country has access to the internet for free with a decent device, I think if you do that, you completely change your company overnight. Because overnight, literally the young generation, we try to box people because of where they live or what, what district they come from or what rural area they come from, but these young people are not thinking like we do. If you give them access to the internet or information or whatever you'd like to call it, in two, three years is completely different. And frankly speaking, he, there's no difference if you're born in Limpopo or Santon or China or Gauteng. All the resources are the same. So you have to put the, give, make the infrastructure accessible to everybody. And there are already companies doing that, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. And the second thing, obviously, is that you need to create funds to support small companies. I think small companies need time to land, and maybe Francois knows his journey better than you guys. <laughs> so it's not always just about building the cool experience, because scale takes time, and it takes time once you get scale to get there. But I think if you do those two things right, I, I mean, and this is a generic statement, but of course the other complications, you completely change the world. And I honestly mean that. I, and I honestly mean the fact that uh, if you gave somebody in Eastern Cape born today, the same platform as somebody born in Morningside, I think they have equal opportunity to be successful because everything is already available to them. And that's why I say digital equalizes opportunity. And I know I'm generalizing, but this is going to start to happen much faster. Um, and the scary thing is the second part, which is exponential uh, scale. When, we sh when I talk about Amazon doubling, literally, if you build a good experience, it is exponential. Uh, but it also means that the journey to irrelevance is also exponential. Big corporations will go out of business overnight, some for many reasons, and we can talk about the philosophical side, but others because when a small company scales, you just can't keep up. It's not anymore about the fact that we're going to sit in a boardroom and have a strategy. That guy has gone from 100 users to 100 million in two months, and suddenly he's taken, he's taken you over. Um, and I exaggerate a little bit just to create the good effect, but the reality is that many will try and respond, but the response will unfortunately be reducing their size by 80% and being small and nimble and trying to catch up. Uh, and catching up is not a good place you want to be in. Um, but it also means that it creates fast... Sorry, I'd say Jade has another I've question. I've got another one. So yeah. you keep referring back to Amazon. Do you not think that is another giant that is yes. forming? Do you not think it's a second rise of tech giants that are now a different type of beast that are doing the same thing, hogging resources, keeping the money out of African countries, things like that, um, that we now have to go fight against in the same way? <laughs> no, I agree with you. I, 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 I think it's, 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 it's an oxymoron because on the one hand much as they were born digital and agile and had speed, they also become victims to what large corporations become. They end up being 500,000 people. And we're very complicated when we're 500,000, you know. We have the same complications, all the corporate cop politics, all the I want to dominate, all the, and you know, you know, all the I'm super successful, I should be the one. Uh, and it does create that uh, problem that you talked about. Then they want to, Scale and size breeds arrogance and power, and that's a dangerous combination. But I'll touch on, what I, on, on that point particularly, because I think that we're also moving into a fascinating world that I don't think it matters how big you are. 
I think what really matters is how strong your purpose is. Because if you really, and that's why I think Jeff Bezos somehow keeps, tries to keep, manages to keep Amazon going, because he, has, he had a very clear view about the customer, and even as they've grown, he's tried to keep that view clear. I think the big problem with the traditional companies that grew big is if you went into one big company today that had 100,000 employees and you asked 99,000 what their purpose is, they don't know. They just become big monsters chasing profits and then they lose their way. But yes, I think it is a challenge. And frankly speaking, I think in five years, there'll be a lot more Amazon-like. I, I didn't even put the Chinese companies there, Alibaba and Tencent, and they're also really doing fantastic stuff and they have a similar sale. So it's, it is an oxymoron that I think, but I personally think as when you grow big, you have to watch out for all the problems of human nature that force all the change that you do. And I'll reflect on purpose because I think that becomes fascinating. We talked about co-creation, so I'm going to move on. Um, but thank you, uh, Jade, and we can keep... If anyone has a question, I have the mic. I'll stand up here. Just put your hand up. And please challenge me, because these are reflections. I am not saying it's, this is what's going to happen. I, I'm just seeing from the view or the world that I've been in uh, of some of the things that I believe are going to change. And you asked about Amazon, and the last slide, I'll reflect on that. But I honestly think that this is one of the shifts that's starting to happen. So we... Ericsson and many of the companies were built or set up for the industrial era of mass production. Um, and it really helped us build the economies of scale that we have. It helped us to build the departments and the supply chains that made us efficient to roll out a product. Unfortunately, as the world becomes a lot more personalized, I think those structures are not relevant. Uh, and because of all the videos that I played, the video earlier and, and, and the conversations that I'm trying to, and the points I'm trying to raise, I think personalization becomes a lot more important than productification. And by that I mean, it's simply about trying to get to a very good user experience. Please caution me on time, because I want us to have a lot of time to have an engagement and not just... Uh, so we should, I should try and finish in 10 minutes so that we can, we can chat. Personalization becomes important. Personalization, however, also means that you have to be able to move fast. You have to be able to be nimble. You have to be able to prototype. You have to be able, sorry, not prototype, to pivot. It means that you have to be able to not be too obsessed with your, with your idea, but willing to start with an idea and change it based on how your customers and your users, and personalization may not be just an individual, it might be a company, sees your solution. And I think you guys, to a large extent, and I don't know the company well, and when I speak to Francois, I feel that he has that DNA in him, and I think that that DNA should not move out from you guys. I think you really always need to be thinking about listening and trying to figure out, you know, what are my customer's problems? What are his pain points, and how do I solve them? Uh, and a lot of you must be really brilliant coders and have built some really cool stuff. Uh, don't get too obsessed with all the cool stuff that you're building. You know, it is really cool, uh, but it's only relevant if it is solving the problems. I think this whole world of personalization is going to make our lives a lot better. I think we'll be able to, to have a customized experience very much to what we want. I mean, and it's already happening. Most of you, when you download an app, you already go to settings to decide whether I want this notification or not, whether I want this on my front page. It's already happening. It's just going to have, it's happening naturally. We don't understand what's happening, but because of the choice and the way we're moving, and it's going to happen faster and faster. And in fact, the companies, without trying to go into AI and machine learning, the companies that understand this, bots and stuff will, will already move it much faster. You wake up in five years, the coffee will be on, the slippers will come to you automatically, the, heat will, the, the shower will be preheated, the car will already be revving up. And I'm, I'm exaggerating, but this is coming very quick. And companies understanding that we want to make people's life convenient. We want to make the consumer... Uh, we, want, we don't want him to be thinking too much, but we also know that that way will engage him. We also know that that way will be relevant to us and that we also know that that way we will be able to monetize him. And that is going to also fundamentally change competition. We talked about competition. So suddenly car companies will be giving you home experiences because they will want your experience to be very seamless from the time you wake up to the time you enter your car. In fact, they won't even be called car companies. And honestly speaking, the only companies that win will be those that will be thinking about your experience and, prove and giving it to you. And that's why I give the examples of Amazon entering sports, entering entertainment, entering retail, while they're always in retail. They understand this. And if you understand this, or Ra Retro Rabbit understands this, they stay relevant. I fear not many people understand this. And maybe some understand it, but they have the complication of being comfortable, 
they have a complication of existing in a world where they sold their product and they're successful, uh, and that's difficult. Of course, we talked a lot about this, so I'm not going to focus on this again. It's all about customer focus. Amazon, RetroRabbit, Ericsson, actually, it's as simple as customer focus, because if, if you are focused on your customer, then you'll be able to personalize. Uh, and if you look at that eight-year-old, I mean, you know, he's already telling off a member of parliament. And by the way, he was telling them in a very simple, unassuming way, uh, but a confident way, because he can be confident. And, and that's how your custom is. They're confident, they know what they want. You guys, when you have a sick, you probably have Googled and know what, by the time you go to the doctor, you have five or six different opinions. Most people do that now. I actually feel sorry for doctors. But the only reason you do that is that half of, and it's actually going to get worse in my opinion. I've seen some statistics to the extent that Harvard Medical School have half their curriculum online. So I think in two, three, four, five years, some people even know more than their doctor who's been there for 30 years because medicine has evolved and they have the latest information and they can argue. So what does the role of the doctor become? I mean, then the doctor becomes more of a caregiver and emotional and, you know, an engager. But you can't suddenly tell the guy, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And he pulls it out and says, yo, I do know what I'm talking about. I just, here it is. And it's by the professor of XXXXX, whatever. But that's where the world is moving. And it's not just about a doctor. It's also about when you launch your product, half of the world will probably have Googled how that software could be done better. I'm not saying I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's the world we live in. And so it doesn't mean that you suddenly become irrelevant. It only means that if you're solely focused on the customer and solving a problem, you have the ability to pivot and then listen to them and adapt. And you start to really not be too obsessed about yourself. And which brings me to the last point, purpose. I really love this purpose thing. I don't want to make this a philosophical discussion, but... Uh, <laughs> you are not your job. I mean, all of us have a unique purpose in life, and you know, the more clear our purpose is, or you know, the more clear it is for us to be authentic and to create. Uh, and companies that really, really understand this well are very, very focused on what we call this purpose. So, because purpose is not a new thing, I think if I simplify it, and Francois and I always have these philosophical discussions, I think human beings have three fundamental things that connect us. I think we all want to matter, and what I mean by mattering is we all feel important, want to feel important. The knowledge we have, we always want to think we're right, and this is why we argue, you know, and to a certain extent, we all are right in our own ways. I mean, we all want to matter, we want our opinion to be there, we want our opinion to make sense, we want our opinion to be the one, and I'm, I'm exaggerating, but we all want to matter, it's a human thing. I think we all want to have meaning, or create meaning, or work for meaning. We all want to do good, we all want to have impact. Uh, and we can say this in so many ways, but we all feel so good when something we produce, I don't want to say changes the world, but has impact. Uh, and irrespective of whether you're in a large company, a small company, you really want to make a difference. Uh, and if that is at the core of what your company is doing, you can create, you can innovate, you can get through, this when she asked me about Amazon, you can get through all the issues that will happen in normal companies, fighting politics, we're, we're emotional, we're human, and if we're human, we'll have bad days, good days, you know. But if our purpose is clear as an organization, and we can talk about it at an individual level, we will be able to get through much. And we all want to make profit, but profit is a means to an end. If profit is the only reason you exist, I am very sorry for you. You really are in trouble. Profit will come, but profit will be an aspect of really having impact, solving a problem, having good. Uh, and I don't want to make this a philosophical discussion, so let's watch a cool video. I play this video because it has some, in my point, reference to what we call the emotional buying power, or just what it means to have user experience. And I hope this one doesn't freeze, but uh, we'll talk a little bit after it. On Super Bowl Sunday, the US is big, loud, and expensive. Sweden is Swedish. So how does Volvo compete with the other car brands and their millions spent on commercials during the game? We don't. We steal it. When you see a car commercial during the game, any car commercial, not Volvo, you can tweet using the hashtag Volvo contest. The interception was simple. Their commercials would give you a chance to win one of our cars for someone you love. 
just tweet their name to Volvo during any car commercial. When Mercedes wanted you to look here, people immediately went here. When Lexus spent 4.5 million for this, Twitter looked like this. Shifting the social conversation to Volvo. With up to 2,000 tweets per minute every time their commercials aired, we changed the Super Bowl conversation from one loud 30-second roar to an ongoing conversation about Volvo that lasted the entire game. We were the only car company to trend both nationally and globally. So they weren't advertising on TV. They were letting all the other car companies do that for them. And just like that, their millions of dollars worth of car commercials turned into a social conversation about Volvo, helping our XC60 to a 70% sales increase the month following the game, the highest in its segment. So this, so this is that was pretty cool. So it, it leads me to my top points. I mean, Super Bowl airtime, advertising airtime is super important. These guys spent millions of dollars, millions. Volvo spent zero. All they did is run a competition on social media saying tweet a loved one, any car commercial, hashtag Volvo contest, and you have a chance to win a brand new Volvo. Because it is about hearts and mind. It's not about product. It's about touching hearts and minds. And if you really are in, uh, thinking about touching hearts and minds, you figure out how to provide that emotional connection. And it doesn't matter how much you have. It's not about resources, because Merck spent six million, and in the old world, somewhere in the Volvo marketing department, guys would be figuring out, you know, Mark is gonna, Merck is gonna probably do this and this and this. Let's get seven million, we'll do this and this and this. And they just didn't do that. All they did was focus on the consumer hearts and minds. I can't even begin to understand that because I'm not as cool as you guys. But the social conversation, the, the world being connected, the digital consumer, this, they engage. They want engagement. They want you to speak to them. They don't give a damn about what you are doing. You know? And if you can find that middle ground or find that touch point, you win. And it's not that digital transformation is not important because you obviously do need to simplify your processes. But if you think about digital transformation in the sense that I'm going to become a tech company, I'm going to simplify my back end, you're getting it wrong. If you think about the consumer and solving their problem or touching their hearts and mind, you're going to win. Uh, and, and that's absolutely brilliant. And I don't work for Volvo, but it's one of my coolest ads uh, and one of the coolest references that I have. But it's simply, that could be anything. It could be any company. You know, it could be Nike supporting this guy who was kneeling down fighting for civil rights. And, uh, and, and I feel that we really, really are moving towards a purpose-led, social conscious-led world where there are these digital animals that are very emotional and want you to speak to them. But that's driving everything. And most go-to-market models today were not built for this. They were not built for that informed customer. I bet you that kid who is eight, you know, his 50-year-old grandfather or 60-year-old grandfather thinks he has a right to tell him or advise him because he has wisdom. Yet, unfortunately, that kid is in a completely different dimension. He probably has 50 times more knowledge than his 60-year-old grandfather. And that's just the reality of a connect, continuously growing and informed digital world. And that is even, I honestly think we're really, really scratching the surface. I mean, you guys who are in computing and technology know even things like quantum computing, which are completely going to blow your mind, autonomous vehicles, etc. But I think the important thing about all the technology shift is also very much about how as human beings, we were not going to change so much, but we're just going to be a lot more informed. We're going to be a lot more personal. We're going to want to have a lot more of an opinion and a conversation. And if you engage us, then you will win. And it's all about culture, really. It's really all about culture, not technology. Technology will be ubiquitous. It's really about continuous learning. Um, I, I hate people introducing me now because I honestly, I'm really struggling to start to learn afresh. You know, I, I don't really think a lot of the stuff I learned in engineering is as relevant. It's relevant in the sense that it helps me understand technology. It's not relevant in the sense of a world where business models completely change, where technology is going to be f completely ubiquitous, uh, and it's all about being able to be agile and learn. Um, 
we're entering a world where we have to take risks, and the reason I started my presentation or the theme is think big, start small, is, is exactly that. I mean, if you start small, you have an ability to kill or take a risk better. You go, you go to market fast, and I, and I know this is very generic, but it's the truth. If you don't spend six months trying to figure out the business case or how cool my software is, if you, if you have a very quick middle ground to go to market and try it, you have a chance to take a risk in a measured way. You have a chance to pivot and kill and be really, really be open to really kill a project or a product because it doesn't make sense. Don't be obsessed with it, please, uh, because the world simply doesn't care. And if you do it fast enough, you stay relevant. Um, and so that ability of continuous learning, really continuous learning is more important. It's not only important for me, it's important for you. Because just imagine that eight-year-old kid when he's your age. I mean, just think about how knowledgeable he will, how how informed you, what he'll be doing. Uh, there were so many other videos I could play similar to that eight-year-old um, where there's a six-year-old boy who is in a plane telling a pilot exactly how it flies because he started reading when he was four because he loved flying. And this pilot couldn't understand, but I mean, today everything is online. So he knew flaps, exactly hydraulics, etc. I'm not a pilot. But that's the world we live in. Uh, and the only thing that's important is, uh, is your ability to continuously learn. And at an individual level, not at a company level, uh, really at an individual level. And if you, if you do that, um, then you stay relevant. Uh, I'm trying, and it's really, really hard. By the way, change is extremely difficult. <laughs> it's really against everything that we know. We tend to see the world according to how we've been raised, our value system, what we've been told, what we know, and we're freaking stubborn as human beings, all of us. Uh, but you really, 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 really do need to change. And, and it's... it's, it's to stay relevant in a fast-changing world, it really is about you um, at an individual level, you know, continuous learning, continuous evolving, um, continuously trying to figure out what's, what's important or not, being open um, that your viewpoint might not be relevant anymore, being open to do reverse mentoring. I'm, I'm trying to speak to 20, I'm not saying this in a bad way, <laughs> I'm trying to speak to 21 or 22-year-olds once a month just to understand the world, because the world sees them as lazy and they don't give a damn, but actually they have choice. You know, they know exactly what they want. So they don't really need to work as hard as I did, because if I didn't get into engineering, then I had very limited op options, and so my parents would push me hard. And maybe I didn't really like engineering, but that was how it was supposed to be as a, in a career. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't really have work hard, but they're different, and they're the ones who actually are consuming. So if you're dismissing them, you literally are dismissing your customer but you're also not understanding that they have a completely different world and a completely different dynamic, uh, which is completely different to how you saw the world. And if you tap into that, you learn. 65% of Africa's population is under 25. They are digital, we're a digital continent. Most governments don't understand it, most governments can't relate to them, most companies can't build products relevant to them. Most organizations don't understand that they're, they're talking to a consumer that not only is so informed and so independent and so knowledgeable, but has choice. And that's why WhatsApp will give him the choice or Instagram will give him the choice because they don't care. They're just obsessed with you. But I think everybody, once they understand the dynamics and the changes, have a chance. And I'll stop there because we could go for another hour. But there's a lot of opportunity. And the last thing I wanted to say is that what I see is that we are also entering what I would call a, a world where there will be. There will be a lot of pain in the short term because automation will change skill sets and companies will cut. But it's creating a lot of transparency. You know, you can't hide anymore uh, as a company. If you do bad, the world will call you out and you'll die. Ask Cambridge Analytica and so many others, Steinoff and everybody. The list is endless and unfortunately I fear the list will be more. Companies that really, really have a deep purpose will really cool create cool products and will care about having an impact and they will be the successful ones. So we'll probably have some really cool products coming out. Uh, we'll have a lot more transparency. It's going to completely change governance. Uh, I honestly think governance will not, governments will not look the, like the way they are today. Politicians uh, have no souls <laughs> and you really will not be able to hide anywhere. Um, and I think we're going to have a lot more purpose-led, deep, ingenuous leaders, genuous leaders uh, caring leaders, caring companies, uh, and we'll find a way to merge with the technology evolution, and we will be able to do what we were created as human beings to do, be creative, have ideas, because innovation creation will never be replaced. Um, thank you. Let's stop there.
And that's my email address. If you want the presentation, I'm happy to share it. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can say some cool stuff. That's all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, LinkedIn, that's my number. I'm very happy to share the presentation. There are a few other slides I'll just show you, but I didn't want to go into them because of time. Uh, some cool things here, you know, but you can reflect on them. <laughs> These two pictures are not mine, by the way. So I but uh, I think there are really some, there's some cool stuff there. And this is just about how you know, we see so many changes in the organization, a lot of the stuff I touched on. But um, yeah, let's, let's have a conversation. Okay. Conversation? Uh, yes, you heard the back. Just a question about what your opinion is on global companies versus like local national companies. Yes. Do you think in the coming years and decades, local companies will eventually be completely wiped by just global companies? Like, so for example, take a lot would then fall to places like Amazon or Facebook or VK, one of the two will succeed and the rest will fail? Or do you think there will be a, how can we say, shared space in the competition market with global companies and local companies? Because, for example, take Facebook, especially with the East and Western divide, yeah. where the companies like Facebook struggle to penetrate places like Russia, China and stuff. Do you always feel that that competition will exist, where, especially given like tax laws and stuff, it's sometimes cheaper to buy stuff over here compared to Amazon? Yeah. That's a look. I, I, it's very hard to predict the future. I, so my personal opinion is that when I say geographical boundaries disappear, I don't think you'll be talking about global and local companies. So I have, for example, Retro Rabbit is born in South Africa. I don't, I don't think if you solve some cool fintech solution, you'll necessarily be a South African company. It'll be necessary everywhere. So I think those boundaries start to blur. I think there's some important points you talked on. I think you know. Sometimes when you look at markets, like in China, Alibaba and Tencent were able to scale because of regulation and protection or local protection for the market, uh, which allowed them to tap into their consumers. So Google and some of the Western companies are quite restricted. But because of that, there was an ability of local consumers, and it's a huge market, uh, to tap into these markets. But if you look at Alibaba and Tencent, they're no longer a Chinese company. They're, they're everywhere. They're tapping. They're like an Amazon for all intents and purposes. I think there are many examples where regulation have allowed local companies to be born. I think we have to be very careful about regulation and control. And I think I was very privileged to be on a panel about two months ago, and I was very impressed with a regulator from Rwanda who talked about the fact that regulation, there is a role for regulation because in the digital world, as technology grows, ubiquitous and companies, they're going to have a lot of access to data, your personal information. You still need to somehow protect the consumer. But you have to be careful not to limit innovation, because if you limit, if you put too much regulation, and frankly speaking, most of these policymakers can't keep up, or they actually will be blown away, then you limit your ability to create the retro rabbits or you know, or the young companies. Finding that balance, I don't know if it's going to be easy. I think. What I think is that you're going to have more competition in a digital space, not a not a physical space. I think you'll still need companies to potentially look at how they can facilitate local industry and find the balance between, you know, curbing what an Amazon can do in every market versus allowing a retro rabbit to scale. But there has to be a middle ground because many people in South Africa use Amazon products or Netflix products and they love them or WhatsApp or love Instagram. And maybe if you're too restrictive, you deny those people an experience, which they enjoy. But if you also understand the world, you can help a retro rabbit scale. It's a completely different conversation, and it's a very difficult conversation to have because most people in policy understand competition in a linear, physical world. Uh, and I think they will soon understand competition is different, but it's going to be painful and tough. Why it's also painful and tough to make all these changes quite quickly is personal relevance. It suddenly makes a lot of the policy makers and government makers and leaders really old school and irrelevant. And we understand in a personal space, in our personal relevant, our survival instinct kicks in. So we're like, we'll frustrate, who are these guys and what do they know? The world will be a different place in five years. I mean, governments are starting to talk about fourth industrial revolution, like a cool conference topic. I think some will start to understand it. One example is Costa Rica has made coding a second language. And some will start to understand it and facilitate growth. And honestly speaking, I honestly believe if you do give every citizen access to digital resources, you really will scale. The last point I want to make is, you know, so let's take South Africa. 
So Cyril's biggest focus is creating jobs. You know, he's going to talk to all these investors, foreign and local, he's trying to create the environment. I feel that sadly he still looks at big corporations as those as an ability, and I feel that big corporations in the short term will shed a lot of jobs because of just the pressures that they feel. I think if he focused on, of course, facilitating those big corporations, but enabling small to medium enterprises, startups, they are going to create the next level of jobs in this industry, and it's very clear to me. So mining, for example, will have huge levels of automation in the next five years, and that's going to shed a lot of traditional jobs. But if you have the honest conversations, maybe that skill set can be pivoted and shifted. Um, and technology is coming. You know, you can put your head in the sand and suffer, or you can try and figure it out and make it happen. Thank but you. I don't have the answers because it's very difficult in an exponential world to really see. Because I'd be lying to you if I could predict, uh, you know, WhatsApp wasn't here five years ago and, you know, somebody would tell you never, they would never be here, or Uber, or ABA, whatever you want to call it. So I, can't, I don't have the answers. I know that if you tap into or understand the trends like Jeff Bezos says, you have a chance. Other questions? Derek? You say we should focus on the customer. That changes the whole way of how the world works and how do we solve the monster problem? So basically what we're making is we, well, I call it the monster problem, basically um, we have all these individuals and they focus about what do I get out of this? Yeah. And that destroys two things that make the world an awesome place. So communities and in South Africa yeah. we call it the boons of caring about yes. people around you. And if we're changing, if the, we are allowing the customer to destroy the world that they live in, how do we fix this? How do we stop them from like, 10 years from now, like, how is the world going to be a better place by us not allowing them to kill like, <laughs> everything that we've built? And you know why I laugh when you ask that question? It's because we, it's always the whole point that the internet is bad and people are doing crazy stuff and they're going to kill themselves, etc., etc. I honestly think is that we, we obviously, I feel we always sometimes look at it from our perspective where we were built, where we grew up in a lot more of a controlled, value-driven, very... Um, traditional world. I would be very honest with you. I honestly feel, and not the generation, and, and, and I don't have boundaries correct, not the generation above 21, 22 to 28, because I feel that they are just social animals about themselves. I feel the generation below that is a lot more driven by impact and good. Honestly, you know, they are a lot more social conscious. You know, even the stuff that they do on social media is more about calling people out and we need to support this brand and that brand is unethical and and I honestly believe once we get past the noise because it's very uncomfortable because it's also making us uncomfortable because of what we know we're going to see a lot more clarity and a lot more purpose driven customer now human beings are human beings I don't think everybody's going to be perfect or whatever but I also think you have to understand you can't control anymore it's impossible. Only thing you can do is have a conversation. If you understand that, then you have a chance to influence the conversation. If you try and tell them what to do, you're wasting your time. And then you think they're crazy and they're going to burn the world. I don't think so. I also think that, and we always have this conversation with Francois, I also think that human beings deep down inside are good people. And I think if the dynamics are correct, our good brother comes out than all the crap. Honestly speaking, I think we should do a whole session on capitalism because I think capitalism has created monsters in the world. It's created an, our inability to actually see good because the world measures us only if we are successful. The well, world measures only if we have a Ferrari or a freaking big house or whatever. So what happens is the normal good human being unfortunately enters that world and tries to get that Ferrari. And that journey is painful. He sells his soul, he backstabs, he kicks, he lies, whatever because the world is just measuring you on that, and, and markets measure on that, and boards measure on that, and et cetera, et cetera, and you think you're doing good, but you're actually doing bad, and you're creating this whole monstrous world. Uh, and I honestly, and this is a little bit philosophical, that's my personal view, I honestly think that we will have an ability, because of a connected, transparent world, to call out all the bad anymore. And very soon people will understand that they can't hide. Very soon people will understand they can't control which is what led us to all this mess. Because it's a little bit of a messy place, the world. Um, and I think, personally, I think this gradually will gravitate towards 
a good world. It's, it's back to the human elements, the natural elements of being a human being. It's like, if, if I want to get through to you and we are fighting, if I come to you and say, look, I'm sorry, you know, let's have a conversation, we have a much better chance to fixing it. Or rather than us saying, I know I'm right, or Derek is wrong, but how? That could go on forever. And it's just the same basics of this whole changing world. Have conversations, engage. Forget about control. I'm sorry. And you might think what you want and tell that 21-year-old, but if the 21-year-olds are 80% of the world, then you have no chance. <laughs> It's fascinating, I don't have the answer, but I honestly think it'll be good. I just think it's uncomfortable for us because it's not what we're used to. Any other questions? One more. Are there? One more. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Uh, I'll probably get a chance to interact with you guys on another day and another time. Right. So you spoke a lot about personalization, and so, so don't you think that personalization might actually cause privacy issues? Uh, so, you know, I don't have the, all the answers. So, I mean, all these things are fascinating <laughs> concepts. If I had all the answers, I'd probably have a Facebook and I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd have a billion dollars, <laughs> etc. cetera. But, uh, but the, point is, the point is that uh, that's why, to his point of regulation, I, I, that's why I still think that regulation is important because at some point we need to protect the consumer in this growing digital world because everything will be online and, you know, the whether it's good, there's also bad, unfortunately. Uh, and so, you know, if I have so much access to information and to your life, I could potentially do bad things. And, you know, once the world, because I'm in IoT, once the world gets so connected and we have autonomous vehicles, we really will be so reliant on networks. So it creates a whole new world of cyber crime and cyber security. And how do we make sure that these networks are because then the cars are simply talking to each other. There's no human intervention. So all is programming. You know, you change the program and they're all hitting each other. I don't have the answer. I think that's where the role of regulation now becomes. Not so much in the sense to control, but to protect the consumer. I, I, I don't know if we will always, we'll get it right in the short term. I think in the end we'll figure it out. You saw all the whole new data consumer protection thing that came up in Europe and companies had to resend stuff. I mean, do you want to sign in? I think that's necessary. But I also think that you have to be careful because a lot of this personalization, frankly, is making our life easier and simpler and better. And you like it, even though sometimes you'll start to complain. Because if we took away all these things, WhatsApp and Facebook and your ability to interact and Netflix, you then would be bored and frustrated. And I don't want this. I want to chat. It's a middle ground. I don't have the answer, but I think regulation is going to start to come in to understand their role is to protect, not to limit. Cool. Thank you very much. Everybody, round of applause for Edgar.